listening to the Devoted Dreamers podcast, and I'm your host, Merit Ansa. I believe God has an unfolding plan for your life, a God-shaped dream just for you. But so much gets in the way, right? Fear, comparison, imposter syndrome. What if I mess this up? You are not alone in those feelings, and I'm so glad you're here for season eight. Keep listening to gain some transformational tools that will help you release the lies so that you can freely show up in the world, offering your gifts, leaning on God in your weaknesses, and serving His kingdom with the dream He's given you. Welcome to episode 196. We are headed into the home stretch of season eight, which is going to wrap up here at the end of April 2021. And I am planning on taking the month of May off from publishing new episodes. But if you pop back over to the show notes for last week's solo episode, number 195, I've shared an entire list of past interviews and solo episodes you might want to check out while I'm away in case you miss them the first time around. My interview today is with Kat Harris, author of Sexless in the City. So I want to begin here with a little bit of a heads up that some of the topics Kat and I discuss may not be suitable for little ears. So do what you need to do or maybe go grab a different episode if you're not in a place that you can listen to this one solo or at least without the little ears. Anyway, by way of introduction, Kat Harris is an educator, author, and podcaster. Her vision is for women to know their beauty identity, and value. She is co-founder of the online publication, The Refined Woman, and host of the Refined Collective podcast. She's also been a full-time photographer for the last decade, with her work featured in Vanity Fair, GQ, Forbes, People, Who, What, Where, US Weekly, Glamour UK, and more. Kat believes in the power of story, that done is better than perfect, quality triumphs quantity, and that the journey truly is the destination. Kat's book is a brave telling of her personal story of navigating questions of faith and sexuality and the realities of life as a 35-year-old virgin. A few of my takeaways from this conversation include, number one, the importance of dealing with our own wounds and disappointments first, before we run off thinking we can save other people while our story remains unfinished or unresolved. Takeaway number two, It's about what can happen when we aren't regularly taking our thoughts captive, as scripture instructs us. And then takeaway number three, that it is in the desert, in our questions and our doubts, that God meets us and walks toward us. And when we have the courage to step into scary things, that's where he meets us. So pop in your headphones or get those kiddos involved in something else and take a listen to this interview with Kat Harris. Hey, Devoted Dreamers, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad you're here today, and I am excited to introduce you to Kat Harris. She's here with me and um, getting ready to launch her first book next week. So this is such great timing that we're getting a chance to talk. Kat, welcome to the Devoted Dreamers podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and just can't wait to connect and Yeah. Chat and talk about all the things. I know. It's really funny. You uh, told me before we started recording that your podcast has been around for three years and your website or blog for like nine. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how have I not heard about you before today or before now, you know, Uh (laughs) but um, this is going to be great. So your book is called Sexless in the City, and we will get to that for sure. But I always start off asking people to talk a little bit about their God-shaped dreams. So we go there with us. Yeah, for sure. And I know, I know you want to talk about the book later, but talk about a God-sized dream. Um, I, I was the girl who almost failed a remedial call English course in college writing my last semester of college. I have been an editorial photographer for the last, oh my gosh, is it 12 years, 12 years. I never in a million years thought I would ever be talking publicly about sex and faith and God and sexuality and gender roles. And the refined woman, like you said, has been around for about nine years. And sort of my, my little path to get there was I was a Bible major. 
went, got into the nonprofit world post-college and then found my way in the photography world and ended up moving from LA to New York after I started my own business to do editorial and fashion. After years of being in the fashion industry, I started my blog and it was mainly style and social media strategy and brand marketing. And I did a lot of work with different brands and fashion houses, everything, everyone from anthropology to soul cycle, and I would create content for them. And then I went through a breakup (laughs) and I, I went through a breakup and still never, ever thought I would ever write a book. And when I, when I talk about it being a God shaped dream, it was, I think sometimes we have dreams that we don't even know we have until we're in the middle of them. And I think that was this book writing process for me before it was even a book. It was me for about five years asking God, and my community and myself and research and strangers and bars and on subways, what do you believe about God and sex? And so now that it's all these years later coming to fruition, that a book is coming out about it. It just, I think I'm constantly asking myself, why me? (laughs) What, how many years has it been kind of, I guess, since that breakup that maybe kickstarted this? Yeah, it's been about seven years. I think that's important for people to hear. Like, A, that we don't always know what the dream is and that it does take some time to percolate and got to reveal stuff to us. So yeah, that's fascinating. And and before we make our lives into a teaching point for strangers, (laughs) we get to live it. Right. We get to live it. I think we so often want anything that we're going through to be an Instagrammable social media soundbite moment for strangers on the internet. And we miss what God is inviting us into before. This is a journey for anyone else. This is my story. God, what do you have for me? What are you trying to teach me? And I think a mentor told me years ago, teach from a scar, not a scab. And I think often we can be bleeding in our heartache or trauma and want to be using those moments to teach as opposed to what if we paused and went undercover and lived the process for a little bit. I mean, in a world where everything is pretty instant, at least like the material things, we've formed a habit in ourselves that like, Oh, I must teach someone from this right now. Otherwise it's not going to be worth it. It's like, no, that, I mean, that's an excellent point. And I think I heard you in um, one of your podcast guests talking about that, that we've got to kind of deal with the hurts and the wounds in our lives before we start like jumping out of planes with parachutes to like save everybody else. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, there's a reason when we get on airplanes that the stewards and stewardesses always say, Put your air mask on yourself first before helping a neighbor or helping the person in the seat next to you. And I take that back to scripture and the invitation of scripture is to love your neighbor as yourself. And often in religious circles or the church, we stop at the first part of that invitation. Well, I'm, I'm supposed to be servant hearted. I'm supposed to be outward focused. But scripture says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I also think the body acts and the, and we be, and so I cannot give what I do not have. And so if I am first and foremost, not showing up for myself, taking responsibility for the space that I'm taking in the world and working through my own stuff, learning to believe in my own worth. There's only so much that I can do and be for others. Yeah. And I think sometimes we try that because, or maybe all the time, we don't really want to sit in the wound and wait for it to become a scar (laughs) because it seems like it's too hard, but gosh, there's so much growth when we are willing to you know, sit with the Lord and ask him, okay, what is it? How, what, how can I learn? How will you shape me through this? Even if it's a place that I'm unwilling to go. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can also hide behind leadership. 
I know I did that instead of really dealing with the disappointment and rejection I felt for being single, for being stuck in the friend zone, for putting myself out there for the umpteenth time, even last week and experiencing rejection, it felt easier to make my life a teaching point for others as opposed to sitting with my own disappointment and my own disappointment in God and my circumstances. And, and also sometimes we can hide behind leadership and it's a bypass to not be vulnerable. So we're talking to strangers or speaking from the pulpit or speaking, we're talking at people as opposed to pausing, sitting with ourselves, sitting with God, inviting real life people into the moment and saying, I'm going through this thing and it sucks and it hurts and I'm disappointed and I don't understand why God isn't showing up for me. It feels like God is answering everyone else's prayers, but mine, why does everyone else seem to get the breakthrough, but me, I feel like it's more difficult to sit in that place. It's easier to say, well, here's three steps to your breakthrough. (laughs) For sure. But the risk of not sitting in that place, it just, it's like shoving it all under the rug. Absolutely. And then we deal with it a decade or two later. (laughs) Or it comes out sideways. Yeah. Or it comes out sideways or we wonder, gosh, why have I not been in a relationship in 20 years? Well, I'm the common denominator in every situation that I'm in. So it can be everyone else's fault for everything in my life. Or I can pause and say, how am I creating this? How am I showing up in a way that is, cause, that is creating the reality I'm in? So do you talk about this in your book? Um, yeah, I do. I talk about taking ownership in your whatever season you're in. I think specifically when I talk about singleness, um, I talk a lot about healing, healing the trauma of our past. Cause I think if we don't heal our past, it, it haunts us. And I know for sure mine was haunting me. I think in my own story, I finally realized I was the common denominator. I was dating and falling in love with guys that were emotionally unavailable, who were not wanting to commit to me, who were running around with other women. I got stuck in the friend zone with a ton of guys. And I would always put all the onus on, man, why do I do these guys are just jerks? Or why do why do guys, why do all guys want to be my friend? And it took a long time for me to realize, oh my gosh. I am, I am, I have a pattern here, whether the, the, I have a couple patterns, pattern of being stuck in the friend zone and pattern of dating emotionally unavailable men. So if it's a pattern, what am I, why is it a pattern? And often we recreate the trauma of our past and our childhood until we get healing from that. It's, you know, why they say things like hurt people, hurt people. And, and also even in the, the friend zone conversation, I was able to really dig through my story. And there's one specific relationship I had. I was crazy about this guy in high school. I mean, he was, he was an upperclassman. I was an underclassman. He was popular. He played varsity soccer. He drove this really cool two-door Mustang. And I just was like, I'm just the like, cotton mouth, sweaty palmed underclassman girl that just has the, the crush on the all-star athlete. And yet somehow we became really good friends. And I was so crazy about him and it never occurred to me that he could ever like me. I just assumed quote unquote, why would a guy like that, like a girl like me? And I wasn't on a date at the time. So he would come and sit in front of my house for hours and we would talk and we would talk on the phone back when there were landlines until late in the night when my mom would hop on the other line and say, get off the phone. And even after he graduated high school, he would come back in town and hang out with me and come to my tennis matches. And it it just... It never occurred to me that this guy could like me because in my head, I was like, oh, he views me as a friend. 
So my friend calls me about 10 years down the road and it turns out her fiance was roommates with my crush post-college. So this had been several years even after we lost touch and he was always talking about this one girl, this one girl that he compared every other girl to, the girl that got away and it was me. I was, (laughs) I was the girl that got away and I'm sitting there and my jaw is on the floor. And my best friend was like, can you believe this? Like if he only knew. And it was such an interesting moment where I realized, wow, he didn't reject me. I rejected me. And because I was so committed to the narrative that I'm in the friend zone, guys don't, why would a guy that I like actually like me back? I created that reality. And I wonder if it's reasons like that why scripture says to take every thought captive and think on what is lovely, pure, holy, good. And I I just noticed even when I just noticed I was paying a really high cost for believing I was unworthy, for believing that my destiny was the friend zone. And it made me wonder, I wonder how many other times I've just assumed a guy didn't like me because Mm. I already took myself out of the game. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And so is that kind of where um, this heart for women to know their value and worth has come from kind of that light bulb, that realization for you? I would say that moment wasn't, wasn't it. It was maybe a culmination of a thousand different moments of, I think we speak the message that we need to hear the most. And I think a huge reason why I even started the refined woman is because for so long, I thought my femininity was a liability I was a woman in a man's world in the fashion industry. And this was before body positivity movement. This was before the Me Too movement. And I think if anything, the I started the Refined Woman out of being in the fashion industry and being one of two women in the photographer's pit in New York Fashion Week. And only getting a seat if I sat in between the legs of a nasty old guy. And I felt like I didn't get job opportunities because when there were networking parties or events, all the guy photographers hung out with each other and it was like a boy's locker room I wasn't invited into. And so it really, I felt as though that being a woman was holding me back in my career until I got an opportunity to be head shooter for a big editorial shoot that ended up being on the cover of a magazine and running for a few national campaigns. And it really was not until then that I saw, oh, actually being a woman is an asset. This, this set is safe because I, I'm setting the pace that there's no gossip. There's no body shaming. This female model feels safe because she knows I'm not trying to take advantage of her, get her to take her clothes off. And so really, if there's the conversation around worth, again, that was another moment where I realized I was holding myself back in my career because I believed a narrative that said my femininity is a liability. Therefore, I am not worthy to have a seat at the table because I'm a woman. And then everything that did or didn't happen became evidence for that. And I had very real circumstances. And why do I think I was in the friend zone? Always because I had very real circumstances that that I was in the friend zone. Why did my femininity feel like a liability? I had very real circumstances that it did, it did seem that way. However, I think the invitation of faith is to lean into possibility and into the unseen and the possibility of hope. And so it really wasn't until I changed that narrative and said, actually, no, I'm going to interrupt this. Actually, being a woman is my secret sauce. And I am worthy. I do have a seat at the table. So I preached this message because it was one I needed to hear. And I thought, man, sometimes you got to preach it out loud until you start believing it for yourself. And I think sometimes we feel ashamed if we're like 
we realize like, oh, I haven't been believing what's true. And so it gets scary to say it out loud, but it's like, no, that's exactly what we need is to speak it until we believe it. So I love that. Um, but I do want you to talk about um, your book and uh, kind of what uh, what it's about and who it's for and um, what you're hoping it will do. Yeah. So my book is Sexless in the City, uh, Sometimes Sassy, Sometimes Painful, Always Honest Look at Dating, Desire, and Sex. And it's my story of growing up in Southern conservative Christian culture in the height of the purity movement. So I learned a set of rules and scripts and beliefs about sex. Good Christians don't have sex until marriage. I learned a set of rules and beliefs about my body, my role as a woman, my experience of dating, all of those things. And I really never questioned any of them until I was in my mid to late twenties. I moved to New York and I was dating more than I had ever dated in my life and found it's a lot harder to not have sex when you're actually dating. And really on the heels of a bad breakup, I went on a journey of researching and asking all the questions that had been percolating under the surface for a lot of years, but I never really asked them because I just thought, oh, this is the way it is. This is God's best. And, and it was kind of like my journey was similar to when you think, oh, I just need to send one email. And then I'll finish, I'll complete the task. But then that one email opens up 50 more tasks for you. I was like, oh, I just want to research the Bible and see what the Bible actually says about sex, if there's anything compelling. And then from there, it was asking questions like, well, what does Ephesians 5 really mean? Am I really supposed to submit to my husband? Like this Archie Bunker outdated mentality? Is that what that means? Is it really the problem of a woman to hide her body so that men don't lust or sin? Really? Is masturbation a sin? What, what, what do we think about desire? What is our identity? Cause it seems like culture says that we are our desire, but the church says to shut it down. And so my book is really approaching these questions and topics head on everything from sex and sexuality to gender roles, to masturbation. And then how do we date in a modern culture? So unpacking all of that through my lens and my experience. And my hope is that I will equip other people, humans to navigate their own journey of figuring out what they believe and why. And, and I also hope in that, that, uh, women and men will experience empathy. I think when I started my research, I found that most of the information I could find, whether it was sermons or books was written primarily by men who got married really young. And at this point I'm 35 and single. And I recently heard a sermon of this very well-known pastor. And she said that if you even hold hands with a guy and he doesn't turn into your husband, that you've created soul ties and you have sinned. And then she goes on to say that she got married when she was 17. And I was like, uh, okay, well, <laughs> you kind of like lost credibility. You don't get to tell me how to date as a 35 year old. Cause you have no idea what it's actually like. And you actually have no idea what it's like to be inviting people to abstain from sex for decades. And so I, I wanted to write the book that I didn't have. I wanted to speak, not just theory, or theology, but my life. And so that I hope that people feel known and seen and validated for their experience as being single in today's culture. And, and then I also want to call the church to a higher standard. We often shame sexual desire. We, we teach that sex and desire is taboo and it's gross and dirty. We shouldn't talk about it. And God created sex. God created desire. It's arousal is God's doing pleasure is God's doing. And so I am just, 
I think I'm just about done with the shame narratives that so much of church culture can offer. And I'm like, we got to do better. Mm -hmm. So I hope to do that through, through my book. I didn't mention this to you, but I got married at 39. So, oh, really? <laughs> I'm oh right there gosh. with you. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think you're right that um, the youth conversations, especially in the church, have been really one sided. And um, I think your book's really important. And so, thank you for being brave yeah, <laughs> to so. write it and put it out there. Yeah. But, I mean, and I guess on that note, like, I'd love to know what the challenges for you have been on this, you know, lengthy journey of getting to this place. Like, I think you said earlier, like you never imagined writing a book and for sure, mm-hmm. not on this topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but if you had to battle. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot, my own insecurities, who gave me the right, who gave me authority, who gave me the authority? Am I the girl for the job? Can I do this? I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> that was a constant battle. I was almost trying to convince my editors and my agents, I'm not the girl for the job. You got the wrong girl. And so I think every insecurity that I've ever had, feeling too much, not enough, too Christian, not Christian enough, too opinionated as a woman, (laughs) all of it. I mean, it, all of those insecurities have come to the surface in this process. And, and then my own theology, my own beliefs have been challenged so much. By the time I wrote the book, I had been walking, living and breathing this stuff for over five years. And then I get to a chapter on virginity and I'm like, Oh, this will be easy. And then writing a chapter, on virginity made me realize how much I worship virginity. And I realized, oh my gosh, I think that my relationship with Jesus has become enmeshed with virginity. And at what point did I start believing that in order to be quote unquote saved, you have to be a virgin. And I never would have said that out loud. I never would have said, I believe that, but at some point in the dialogue, I think subconsciously or um, implicitly, so not explicitly, there was a, there was a message that I internalized that said it's it's not Jesus alone equals salvation. It's Jesus plus virginity plus the acceptance of others plus working your way into the kingdom, all that stuff, and so. I felt at every turn in this book, I was challenged. And even when I was researching what the Bible had to say about sex, it made me ask the question, well, what even is sex? And why have I defined it the way I've defined it my whole life? Where did I get, where did I get that standard from? And I had always thought, oh, sex is when a penis goes inside a vagina. That's sex. And then I did a bunch of research and asked a bunch of questions to a bunch of people and started asking new questions like, huh, so is oral sex sex? What about anal sex? How does, how does orgasm play into sex? Do we have sex? Does sex mean orgasm? What about if you don't identify as heterosexual? Do heterosexuals have a monopoly on virginity? That's a lot of questions. How do we answer these questions? And so, yeah, I mean, these are all things that I was going through on my own and then thinking about, wow, not only am I navigating these really hard questions that feel very nuanced, and the more I ask, the more gray I see in a lot of, a lot of these, then it's like, so how do I now write about something? Mm. How do I write about this? And how do I share what I believe to be true and also hold space for people to be on their own journey? How do I maybe ask more questions than I give answers? Because really it's in the questions that we each get to seek God on our own account. Because I think the last thing we need is another set of list of do's and don'ts. Um, so yeah, I think all my insecurities are screaming all the time. I get (laughs) so much, I get so much hate on a daily basis on Instagram, on DMS. And, um, so yeah, it's like, 
It's like having a bruise that you don't know is there until everyone starts bumping up against that bruise. And then it's challenged me to really dig into what I believe and why. Yeah, and I think my next question was going to be like, how how has God met you in that? And how do you continue to walk forward in the face of, you know, this bruise that you mentioned and people like actual real people? I don't even know what word to say, <laughs> like coming at you, I'm sure on yeah. these topics, like, what do you do with that? Well, I let myself be human. I have human moments. <laughs> it hurts when people say mean things to you. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I walk into is that God has so much space for us. God has so much space for me. And God does not have a fragile ego. And so me asking questions, me doubting, me sort of deconstructing the beliefs that I've held up to a certain point and digging into the why behind those does not mean I don't love God. In fact, God really, really, really has space for us. And I, I think I've just felt encouraged by encouraged by stories and characters in scripture where we see King David is total mess up. (laughs) And we read the Psalms and it's like, God, I love you. You're so freaking amazing. And then the next Psalm, it's like, how far, how long have you, will you leave me downcast? Where are you? You never come. (laughs) And then we see Peter in the new Testament, get really, get it really, really right. And get it really, really wrong. And we see Jesus honoring the doubt of the father who asked Jesus to heal his demon possessed son. And the father says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Basically. I don't know. I believe some days, maybe like an hour a day, or I want to believe, but I don't know that I do. And instead of judgment, Jesus blessed him. And so I think it's constantly just trying to give myself the permission to lean in. It can feel scary to question. It can feel scary to take a statement and ask, well, what are the beliefs underneath this statement? So when I say some, when we, when I say something like, oh, I was taught my whole life that modest is hottest. I was taught that men are more physical than women. And because of that, they have more sexual desire than women. And because of that, it's harder for them to quote unquote, stay pure. So because of that, boys will be boys. And because of that, it's the job of the woman to cover her body so that men won't stumble. So when I say something like modest is hottest, what I'm really saying is that boys are animals and they're not human. And that they don't have the capacity to take responsibility for how they're showing up in the world. So I am D de- I have, a, I'm having a low view of men and an effect also oppressing an entire gender, which would be the women. And so I think giving myself the permission to say, wait a minute, what are we really saying when we're saying this stuff? And what does it really mean? And is this really true? Because a a good soundbite sounds great and it can be very preachable, but not very livable. And what I hear you saying too, is that our words really matter and it's worth taking the time to be like, to examine, am I being precise? Am I saying what I actually mean? And do I believe what I'm actually saying or am I just repeating like you said, a soundbite that somebody told me that I thought at the moment, well, that sounds good. I'll believe that. I heard us. I was, I went to church for the first time in almost a year because right. COVID and people aren't meeting in person. And I went and the pastor said something and I instantly was like, yes, all oh, that's so good. Like amen him down. And then I was like, wait a second. I actually think what he said is really problematic. And I actually have 10 follow-up questions about what he meant by that statement. It was just, I think sometimes we want to hear like, let go and let God Mm -hmm. (laughs) just pray about it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, all things work together for the good of those who love God. 
well, okay, we can say that. And also that might be a very insensitive response to someone who's going through a really big heartbreak or experiencing death of a loved one, or we'll just have more faith when, well, gosh, I'm, I'm struggling with debilitating anxiety attacks. Mm. I have faith, (laughs) but, but but I think we want to just put a stamp on something. We want to put band-aids on it and then things magically get better. And I thankfully think that God created us more complicated than that. Yeah. I think you're right about that, (laughs) but it seems harder, quote unquote, harder to go dig into that. Mm -hmm complicated self that we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you've talked a lot about scripture. Um, Is there a verse that has um, supported you as you've been on this journey with lots of ups and downs and questions and doubts? Yeah. Oh, goodness. I mean, I think I think two come to my mind. One is Isaiah 55 and the whole, there's a portion of the, of the chapter that says as the rain comes down from the heavens and doesn't return back up to the heavens without producing fruit and seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is God's word. God's word doesn't go out to the void it always returns back and fulfills that, which God uh, purposed. And I think that has felt really freeing to me because I think truth is truth is truth. And I can trust in my pursuit of truth that God's truth is out there and it's not going to return back void. And so that doesn't mean I'm going to have answers to every single question that I'll ever have, but I do think it means that I can seek and that even when I'm sharing truth, I can trust that it's once it's out there, it's not my responsibility for what does or doesn't happen. Like the truth that's supposed to land will land. Um, so that kind of releases some of that pressure on, on me. That doesn't mean I want to be like willy nilly or, um, not wise with what I put out there and be like, well, it's on you. No, <laughs> like I get to be wise and discerning with what I put out in the world. And then I think Isaiah 43, 19 has been such a sweet verse for me for such a long time in singleness in my career. And even as I've navigated doubt and questions and the verse is, says something like, um, look, God is doing a new thing. God is the God that makes streams out of the deserts. And so just that picture of, I think when we go on a path of whether it's deconstruction or doubt or, working through our past, it can feel like, oh my gosh, I'm in a desert. I am all alone. And all I see all around me is miles and miles and miles of the Sahara desert. Is this ever going to end? How can I ever experience breakthrough when you're in the thick of it? Yet typically like this text says, it's in the desert that God meets us. It's in the unexpected moment, the place that may feel like the scariest place to walk towards is the place where God actually meets us, which is just feels really counterintuitive. So even asking the questions that I'm afraid to ask, cause I'm afraid of what I'll find out about God. I'm afraid about what I'm afraid of what I'll find out about another person or even myself, but in having the courage to step into that place, that's, I know that's where God's going to meet me. Yeah. I feel like that brings us kind of full circle back to that conversation of, how important it is to not just bury the hurts and not just um, ignore a, a wound or something from your past, but to cry out to him and ask him to be near, to let you know that he's near and to walk with you through it, through that wilderness. Yeah. yeah. That's really great. Oh, Kat, this has been a really fun conversation. <laughs> 
<laughs> and some topics that have not entered into my podcast thus yes. far. So thank you for um, doing that for us as well. But um, I'd love to have you just um, as we close kind of uh, look back, I guess, at who you were before you began this journey and um, then share like how has God changed you and transformed you in the process of saying yes to um, work through difficult things and to pursue a dream that he's put on your heart? Yeah, I think I didn't realize how attached I was to being accepted by other Christians. I want to be liked and approved of by my pastors and by leaders and mentors and friends. I want to fit the bill. And, 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 and because of that, for a long time, I pretended like certain narratives didn't make me uncomfortable. I pretended that it didn't bother me that I didn't see women in leadership or women preaching from the pulpit. I pretended that dating was overwhelming and that I should only date if it's, if I know it's my husband. So I had these, I just wanted to, I almost, I was playing the game of Christianity and I loved God and I love God and I love Jesus. And in that I think when I finally allowed myself to go on this journey was really one of the first times that I stepped outside of the mainstream. And that was really scary because a lot of people proud still to this day are like, you are not a Christian. And I'm like, or your story is so racy. I'm like, well, I'm still like not having sex until marriage folks. <laughs> like um, my story's not that racy. Um, but I have, in this process, given myself permission to address the elephants in the room, to ask the hard questions, and in that realize that everyone's wanting to do that. Everyone, everyone's wanting to do that. And so I think I thought I would experience so much rejection, and I have. And I've also felt as though I've been in a room that was really dark and I lit a match and thought I would be there all by myself. And then all these matches started being lit in the room. And so I think a huge way that God has transformed me through this process is just validated that I have the permission to doubt. I have the permission to question, to go against the grain, to seek, to not just take my pastor's word for it, but to do the work for myself. And that in that, when I step outside, that that's not me leaving everything, but that's like God meets me in the gray. God meets me in the nuance and layers of life. And I think that's been really life-changing. Thanks for listening today. Don't let the conversation end here. Let's connect over in the Devoted Dreamers Insiders Group on Facebook. We're building a sweet community of dreamers so no one has to walk this road alone. You can find the group at bit.ly slash dreamer group. I'll see you in there.